And we're back. Hello, hello everyone. How was a break? Anybody do anything fun? Going on a trip? <laughs> okay, fair enough. Speaking of which, if you're feeling stressed around, you know, exam time or just in general, there's a, a mental wellness center here that people can check out uh, discreetly. And that is at your disposal. So speaking of mental wellness, speaking of uh, directing your mind in a beneficial way, as always, we're going to do a little review and we're going to build on these concepts. So metacognition, as you know, is a fancy word for what you all do all the time. We're always, from the moment we wake up in the morning, we're aware of how we feel. We're aware of our thoughts. You focus your attention. I need to focus on getting out the door on time. I need to focus on eating in five minutes so I can shower in five minutes so I can get out the door. Anybody? Does that uh, ring, a, ring a bell to anybody? You're always focusing your attention. You're always monitoring your thoughts. From the moment you wake up, even asleep, you can have lucid dreaming where you're suddenly aware of the fact that you're, you're dreaming. I don't know if that's happened to anybody. You, you can train yourself to do that. You can actually metacognitively train yourself to be aware of yourself while you're dreaming. Uh, Jim Davies has, uh, has some instructions on this. There are some things online. If you, I don't suggest it because I actually tried to learn how to lucid dream and I was successful and then I would just wake up because I would realize I'm not standing on a hill overlooking a mountain. I'm actually lying in bed and no, now I'm awake. So I said, well, this isn't very fun, but there are actually useful metacognitive things you can learn, such as learning how to monitor and control your mental states better because wherever you're going to go in life, you're going to be applying your intelligence, or you're going to be applying your mind, and if you can learn how to apply it better, you can do better. So, just like anything, from the moment you wake up, you're monitoring, you're monitoring your external states, but you're also aware that you're awake, monitoring, and controlling. You're trying to control your will to get out of bed. You're trying to gain the motivation. You're trying to, um, you know, maybe you decide five more minutes, maybe you decide I should get up now. Yeah, five, the eternal five more minutes. But basically, these are things that we all do all the time. It's ambient in our lives. We're aware of our own thoughts and feelings and we control them. So, monitoring. Control. Can, can't stress this enough. Does anyone remember the marshmallow test from, from last week? This poor, poor little boy being told that if he waits 10 minutes, he'll get a second marshmallow. And he's really really trying to control his mental states. You're not just controlling your emotions, you're controlling your attention. He's trying not to look at it. No, don't look at it, because the more you look at it, the more you're going to want to eat it. So controlling your monitor, <laughs> he's really suffering here. Sure, yeah, so system one, so the question was whether uh, when you're young, you're in a system one sort of state. Sure, you're just going about eyes open, what captures your attention? So it's system one metacognition where your attention is drawn to things that you think are pretty neat. So with a baby, you can just jangle keys in front of them and their attention is transfixed. And then as they go about the world, they're opening drawers, they're climbing things, and they're, they're basically, their actions are being led by their feeling of curiosity. Uh, but then as you grow up, you learn cognitive and declarative knowledge about the world and you can build a, a large mental map and then you can hook things together and do very, very complex, advanced things as a result of using system two. So um, one of the best pieces of advice that I ever got was uh, by a, a guidance counselor way, way, way long ago, where, uh, and you may have heard this before, they say, if you want to know where your heart lies, just be aware of where your mind goes when it wanders. Be aware of where your mind goes when it wanders. Metacognitively be aware of your own thoughts, and if your mind is naturally drawn to music or math or, or anything, then that's, that's a good sense of uh, where you're innately talented or interested. So uh, these are all metacognitive actions you can do to, to engage with your mind better. Okay, so again, this, this is an important concept because it builds up on this idea of you have your awareness, the, the now state of the system, right? now and now is constantly refreshing in your working memory. Uh, and so if you uh, learn some, some, some technique for engaging with your mind, such as increasing your attention and increasing your attentional control, what I just told you about um, being aware of 
where your mind goes and learning your innate passion that way. These are, these are meta-knowledge, concepts that refer to your own mental states. They're in your working memory. And then well, you can decide what to do with it, but they can control your attention. They can control your emotion. They can control your life in a way that's more beneficial. But concepts going into working memory, activating procedural knowledge that arise to match the content of working memory, and then, and then act it out. So this goes back to the other question of how is behavior directed by, by thoughts? Thoughts go into working memory and procedural knowledge acts it out. So basically things are constantly entering your working memory. Procedural knowledge is constantly rising to match it and then acting out those things, feelings, thoughts. Uh, but largely it's automatic. So here's a, another little animation as you've seen before. This is a closed eye. You have working memory here. So an initial state of feeling brings up meta knowledge that matches to it. That feeling is of being distracted, and then you can have an instruction to focus, which then directs mental actions to focus. Memory, it, it rises to match uh, the content of working memory, and then you can use those instructions to, to guide your mental actions beneficially, instead of just remaining distracted and then panicking before a test and not doing well. Uh, you can learn how to focus in a way that is profoundly beneficial. We just learned system two, where meta knowledge enters your working memory and then acts out beneficial states, focus, emotional control, things that are in your long-term benefit, things that maybe you're not, uh, that don't just arise naturally because, you know, focusing is hard. Emotional control is hard, but the consequences of not doing it can be cataclysmic. And so we all know that uh, there's a great motivation to telling yourself, you got to focus now. This is really important. You got to focus. You got to do that task. You've got to not blow up at this person. You've got to try to remember, try to take good notes so that you can then recall the information later on. So um, that's system two, deliberate use of knowledge. System one, more like a child. You're feeling curious things, good things, and it's driving automaticity. Automatic procedural knowledge comes up and just ballistically fires like bullets just automatically. The kid isn't really aware of what they're doing. They're just, you know, you've seen a kid just in a room. They're just looking over things. They're pulling gum from underneath the table. They're, they're trying to reach people's pockets. They're, they're, they're climbing up on desks. Their, their awareness of some, some sort of curiosity is, is causing ballistic firing of procedural knowledge. Or there's a little negative sign there, sort of like a battery. Positive things make you move towards it. Negative things make you move away from it. And so a kid will smell something bad and they just automatically push away whatever food they're being given, vegetables, or, um, you know, if they see something scary, they'll automatically run away from it. But you can train yourself to run towards scary things like uh, emergency responders. So system automaticity is very much like a child. You want positive things and you want to move away from negative things. And your mind will automatically do this over and over and over. And if you just let your mind go, it'll just automatically move towards positive things and away from negative things. And you may have noticed those positive things aren't always in your best interest. Moving away from negative things aren't always in your best interest. If you moved away from every negative thing in your life, well, you wouldn't be here and you wouldn't have the good things you have now. So um, this is an important aspect of Deliberate control, more human control over mental states for our long-term well-being, and automaticity, blind automaticity of just wanting good things, moving away from negative things. And automaticity these days is not so good. So here we have again the blind automaticity you see up there, working in the background of your mind, working automatically whether you want it to or not. So runaway automaticity is something we as humans all need to deal with because this is just the fundamental habit pattern of our minds. We're all born with this, and if we don't learn to control it, it can become this runaway process. So automatic mental and behavioral actions can be either beneficial or harmful. Uh, by default, again, we all as animals seek pleasure and avoid pain. And without deliberate restraint, automatic behaviors increase and increase to become harmful or totally self-destructive. And our society is full of people who have let their automaticity just run away with them. And it's just very sad what happens when people's automaticity gets away from them. And so here's something I was showing a long time ago for runaway automaticity. As you may have seen this before, this is an old Charlie Chapman video of, well, used for a different context, but he's trying to keep up with the automaticity of what's happening. 
But at some point, it gets away from him. He can't quite keep it together and just blindly reacting to automaticity over and over and over. You can never keep up with all the good feelings you want. You can never move away from all the negative feelings. And if you just let that direct your life, it will eat you alive. And that's the danger of runaway automaticity. It accords with many um, psychological principles. We talked about conditioning, operant conditioning, uh, where pleasant outcomes cause behaviors to increase. Usually they're just, you know, like a child. You, they'll just eat all the junk food. They will watch all the TV. They will jump off something high if they think they can fly. This looks like fun. They will run into traffic if it looks like there's some sort of fun thing to do in the middle of the street. Blind automaticity is something that is led around by our positive and negative feelings. We talked about heavy in learning. Neurons that fire together, wire together. Once you have a positive result from something you're looking at on your phone, the internet, your food, uh, some sort of behavior, it causes that behavior to be more likely to increase in the future. Um, and it then wires in stronger and stronger and stronger, making that behavior or thought pattern more common. Anybody ever hear about the experiment with a monkey with a, a box that was connected to his brain? So a monkey was given a box with a button on it, and the button was attached to his brain, the pleasure centers to his brain. So if he pressed the button, he'd get a sharp jolt of pleasure. And so guess what the monkey did? Pressed the button over and over and over, getting sharp uh, jolts of pleasure over and over and over. And the monkey just sat there day and night, giving up food, giving up mating, giving up water, giving up everything. Just press that button over and over and over. And if they hadn't taken the box away from the monkey, this poor little monkey would have pleasured himself to death. And this is uh, a metaphor for a lot of things in our own lives where if you are just blindly reacting to automaticity over and over and over, um, it increases behaviors, it gets away from you, and uh, it can lead to catastrophic results, and yeah, not so good. There's researchers talking about the cognition crisis today. This is a little heavy, but it's important. Uh, many psychologists believe the world is facing a global mental health crisis. One that's very unique to modern times. Uh, neuroscientist Dr. Adam Gasly calls this problem the problem of ancient brains in a high-tech world. So humans, as we talked about last class, evolved for a very different environment. And our biological instincts are struggling to keep up with a sea of information and artificial stimulation. Our poor little monkey wiring in our brains uh, evolved for a more paleolithic or Neolithic world, where pleasure was a little more scarce, negative things were a little more abundant, and pleasure wasn't as abundant as it is now, which, as we talked about, can cause a binging reflex in our minds that can cause runaway automaticity. And so this abundance of stimulation and pleasure and, and more and more and more entertainment has created a worldwide surge of anxiety, depression, addiction, and other cognitive issues. You would think a world full of more pleasure than has ever been ever existed. You'd think a world full of more abundance than has ever existed. People would be happier. Are we? There is something more profound than immediate pleasure. And small-scale immediate pleasure does not create long-term happiness. And there is decades and decades of research on this where um, people, if they were asked, would you like to be hooked up to a pleasure machine where you'd just be given uh, just jolts of pleasure for the rest of your life until you passed away? Or do you want to engage with a less pleasurable reality in, in a meaningful way? Most people say, that sounds horrible. This looks like an actual nightmare. It doesn't matter if I'm in some euphoric state. I want something more than just blind happiness. People want meaning. And people will often give up small-term happiness in order to achieve long-term meaning and greater welfare. 
Uh, this may include giving up short-term pleasures for us all. So a side effect of modern technology, such as apps and games, social media, online content, is that it hacks our, and hijacks the learning pathways of our, of our brains that evolved for a very different environment. So uh, there is a, what's called an evolutionary mismatch between our hardware and the modern world. And this mismatch is causing compulsive behaviors, attentional issues, emotional problems. And it's important to understand that letting it just be, I'll deal with it later, I'll deal with it later, I'll, you know, whatever I feel compulsive attraction towards will um, only increase over time. And so one way to deal with blind automaticity is to get a control of your own mind, get a hold of yourself. And that involves, uh, in some way, a firm decision, system two metacognition. And that's how you overcome blind automaticity, whether it's just a feeling of distraction or dysphoria. This is a, a artist sculpture of what alcoholism feels like. It sucks people into a a cage of, well, uh, a very non-pleasurable experience where blind automaticity just utterly consumed them. Same with entertainment, the siren call of apps, phones. You can ask yourself, is it leading towards your long-term well-being? Of course, some is good, too much is catastrophic. So this is called the cognition crisis. Now, this is something that seems uh, like a stage of history. People have talked about how this is just a stage of history where it's very new, where we get all this abundance. Technological scientific progress has led to a bonanza of good things to eat and fun things to watch. And unless we um, don't let that become our the, the fullness of our lives, uh, if we do, it, it will lead to psychological, attentional, mental problems that are not in our long-term best interest. So this is also called the prison of automaticity, something we all have to deal with uh, in the long term, where this can be the cause of addiction, which is uh, defined as a neuropsychological disorder characterized by a persistent and intense urge to engage a behavior despite harm and negative consequences. If you're engaging in a behavior and you're not feeling compulsive and there's no negative consequences, that doesn't really qualify as an addiction. If you can't stop yourself from engaging in some behavior, if you keep promising yourself that next time you won't, you know, uh, buy that pack of cigarettes or drink to excess or whatever, whatever your poison is, uh, then that qualifies as addiction an urge to engage in behavior despite its harm and negative consequences. And you would think that scratching that itch makes the behavior decrease over time, when in fact it just makes the itch increase. Repetitive behaviors can alter the brain in ways that increase craving, and then increase it more, and then increase it more. And maybe you've seen people or passed them on the street where their runaway automaticity and the desire to decrease the craving has and trap them in a mental prison where they are utterly consumed by a desire to satisfy this craving. Whether it's drugs or alcohol, we can use this Hebbian learning, reward learning framework for a behavior causing a reward, plus one makes it more likely for the behavior to increase, plus one. And the behavior then creates a reward, plus one, which then creates more behavior, which then creates more reward, this is system one automaticity, over and over. This happens outside of your awareness, which is why you can promise yourself all you want that you won't do that thing. Well, unfortunately, nature has wired you pretty well to want pleasure and avoid pain. And so people can find themselves automatically moving towards whatever uh, addiction or compulsive behavior has uh, run away from them. Any questions? Sorry, you and then Emily. Go ahead. So this Hemi network, is that what both causes and prevents addiction, Steve? Mm, uh, not quite, but close. Uh, so this Hebbian network or, or reward learning, I say, is a, is a better 
terminology for this, reward learning is closer to what causes behavior, where behavior or some pattern in your, your neurons is then rewarded, causing that behavior to increase over time. And this happens outside of our awareness in system one. And one of the only ways of decreasing it is by using our system two deliberate use of knowledge to overcome this. We've talked about some methods of doing that. You can engage in mental training or you can engage in the Odysseus strategy where you deliberately put the things that you're addicted to outside of your uh, ability to get it. You don't keep the internet in your home. You've made that decision that you can't stop yourself from whatever compulsive behavior it is. You put data blocks in your phone. You don't keep alcohol in your house. You don't hang out with people who do hard drugs if you have an, an addiction that way. Because addiction is runaway reward learning. And the animal part of our brain can just gallop and gallop away from us uh, wanting those short-term rewards over and over and over, thinking that this time I'll be satisfied. Okay, well, this time. Okay, I'll never do that again. Okay, this time. And um, it, people can become quickly humbled by thinking that they can uh, uh, control it. Sorry, uh, Emily, I, sorry, I forgot your, you had your hand up there. That apply to certain symptoms of mental health issues like catastrophization, stuff like that, where you would see mm. one aspect of your life having a minor issue but the brain's sure that's a, that's an excellent question that actually you just uh look down the road in terms of my next slides where so the question was can this result in patterns of negative thinking where some minor thing in your life can become catastrophized uh yeah because system one metacognition is being duped into thinking that whatever negative emotion you're feeling isn't just a small impermanent a stimulus. It's actually this world-ending uh, cataclysmic event. Uh, and your mind tells your the rest of your system that this is incredibly important. In fact, this is the most important thing. And you then bring all your mental and energy uh, to it, and it then gallops away from you. Go ahead. That's okay. So that's, there's another looking down the road where you can intentionally cause beneficial automaticity. You can deliberately create beneficial automaticity through metacognitive training that runs by itself. Sorry, I saw another hand up. Yeah. I will answer that through a series of crafted slides. You've seen this? Okay. Uh, well, this is, this is, uh, I'm going to get to your question in a second, but this is somebody made an animation of how addiction works. And it's called Nuggets, and this little bird finds some addiction, it's not necessarily a drug or alcohol, but it's something that makes them feel great, euphoric. They're flying. Your neurons are pumping out all kinds of pleasure chemicals, but when you come down, oh, you crash hard. You crash hard. And then you try it again, thinking, I will need to experience this again and again, again and again. And yes, for a short time, you're off, you're flying, you're euphoric, you're feeling good. Oh, but gravity is a harsh mistress, and it brings you down, and you're not feeling so good that next time. You need more and more of whatever that pleasure is. You want less time between uh, you experiencing that pleasure. And you think, maybe this time, this will be permanent. And for a time, seems to work. It seems to bring back color and pleasure. But your brain starts to adapt. Your brain adapts very quickly through this principle of homeostasis where your brain starts to think whatever that pleasure standard is becomes the new normal, whatever it is, until eventually you can't get enough. Your brain needs that just to feel normal. And it's a very sad situation where you're in an utter pitch blackness of experience and you need that, what made you fly beforehand, you need that just to feel normal again. I want to talk about what is really worth catastrophizing. It's runaway automaticity that, uh, without our restraint, can lead us into a pretty miserable experience. Good news. Good news, everyone. Metacognition can restrain harmful automaticity. We're not slaves to whatever runaway reward learning seems to hijack our brains. There has been decades of research, and the data has been accumulated 
on metacognitive practices such as cognitive therapy or meditation, where you deliberately just interact with your own mind over and over and over in a beneficial way that then becomes a habitual process that runs on its own beneficially. Daily meditation, we talked about the, uh, the scientific study of Vipassana in particular, uh, has evinced a variety of cognitive benefits, such as increasing executive control, your ability to not eat that marshmallow or <laughs> restrain yourself from whatever addictive tendency. It helps you reduce stress, anxiety, depressive symptoms. So there are training practices where you can engage in mental training over and over and over, which then becomes automatic and then frees you from many blind automatic processes. Because blind automatic processes, as we said, can run away with you. So uh, there are long-term benefits of this that have been studied in the brain, neurophysiological changes. Uh, they study the brain of long-term meditators or people who have engaged in mindfulness or um, cognitive behavior therapy. They have found connections and new growth of neural wiring that increase well-being and cognitive control and focus and attention. And there's the strengthening, this heavy in learning that runs the other way towards uh, mastery of one's own mental processes. And um, this has been observed in hundreds and perhaps thousands of people under laboratory conditions. So meditation is shown to uh, enhance executive control by strengthening connections in particular in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So we talked about the how the brain evolved and the skin of the onion, where the middle part is the earliest part of the brain, and the layers got built up on top of that as our brain evolved. And then the uh, neocortex is one of the latest and greatest, more human developments. And the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is 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 part of that and we see a strengthening of responses uh, in the way that a muscle builds up when you work out at the gym and then you find yourself able to do a lot more effortlessly you find that life gets a lot easier uh, focus is easier emotional control is easier perhaps your psychological well-being goes up and your negative emotions go down yeah exactly so system one and system two can can engage heavy in learning you your automaticity can blindly program you have been learning uh, that that wires that neurons that wire together fire together and just blind avoidance of negativity and blind attraction towards pleasure or you can control it deliberately through metacognitive training where you bring in uh, instructions that enable you to practice it and as you deliberately practice some instructions that also trains up your heavy and learning because you're engaging in a in an action over and over and over, which then wires your brain to that action. Meta emotions. Meta emotions are emotions that occur in response to other emotions. So guilt about sadness, or if anybody's ever told you other people have it worse, that is a not particularly beneficial bit of software that, as I've said, makes as much sense as saying you can't be happy because other people have it better. Meta emotions can occur in response to other emotions from bad cultural software or just blind automaticity where we have a negative emotion. We don't like that. It causes a secondary negative emotion. And runaway automaticity of negative emotion to negative emotions can cause people can be consumed by negative emotions. And this is just a reflexive response that uh, occurs as a basic state of pleasure or displeasure. This can include moods. So for instance, one may be angry about feeling frustrated. You can then feel enraged about feeling angry about feeling frustrated. And this can cause a rage problem that consumes people, trains up your heavy and learning to then people are just seething and, and roiling in anger all the time and are always looking for something to be upset about or outraged about. Anybody ever notice that there are some people who are reflexively outraged about things? And that usually got trained up due to meta emotions. Uh, maybe they don't have a sense of meaning or purpose or feel a, cer a certainty in their lives. Uh, but when you can feel outraged, oh, now you get a sense of certainty. You get this pseudo feeling of truth and meaning and 
sureness and goodness and virtue. And so that can cause meta emotions to then reward feelings of outrage and then reward it again until you don't want to drop out of those feelings of, of outrage because then you're left to be uncertain and in a state of perhaps less meaning or, or what have you. And so people due to meta emotions can feel outrage. That felt good. I'm going to get more outrage. If that felt really good, now I'm going to scan every situation for what I can get outraged about. But people can have their emotions trained up in a way that is not beneficial and it is utterly not connected or not proportional to reality. Why? Because emotions can cause secondary emotions that then increase the, uh, those emotions to become more prevalent over time. So it's very important to watch your response to your emotions. Oh, did you like that emotion? Are you now making that more likely over time? Is it causing you to then seek out reasons to feel that emotion? That then trains you up and makes you uh, addicted to those pleasurable feelings uh, in a way that then can consume you in the same sense. Yep. Is this some... (laughs) <laughs> sure. There's a lot of this uh, runaway reward learning in our thoughts and our feelings. Uh, if some thought gives us some pleasurable jolt, then we'll chase that thought. There's a theory that a lot of conspiracy theories are growing because people get a pleasurable jolt of endorphins. And so what do they chase? More conspiracy theories. I get a feeling of connection because, oh, that you know shadowy group is connected with that shadow group. I got a I got a pleasurable feeling of connection there. I want more of that. Let's draw more strings until you've seen the meme of the person with the strings on the board and they're smoking and they're showing how there's connections all over the place, man. What they're doing is they're an addict to feelings of integration and pleasurable feelings of connection that they don't care if it's true. They're not chasing truth. They're chasing the feeling of truth. They're chasing the feeling and they can never, ever get enough. So they're not chasing the conceptual truth. They're chasing feelings, pleasurable feelings of truth that they become addicted to. Go ahead. So the question was, what if it's not a good feeling? Can you be addicted to it? If it's pure, uh, if there's no secondary positive emotion, then generally no, because what you're actually experiencing is some negative emotion. If you're addicted to it is you are experiencing a pleasurable meta emotion. So people like to put on a sad song or a sad movie and they like to feel, they enjoy the feeling of being sad, of wallowing in it. There is a secondary meta emotion that comes from it. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it, right? Uh, People like the feeling of being enraged because it gives them this sense of certainty and they get this meta emotion of feeling strong and powerful because maybe they don't feel that in their lives. And so they, they get addicted to emotions because it creates a positive meta emotion. So meta emotions, if we can look in a computational architecture, we can get clear on the mechanisms involved. We get in working memory. We have some negative emotion in here. Some little negative emotion, like the sign on a battery. Negative is bad. Then we have procedural knowledge rise up to match it, which then creates a secondary, larger negative emotion. And again, more procedural knowledge rises up to match that. And it creates a worse negative emotion. This is how we catastrophize or how we increase the negative emotions in the emotional storehouse of our subconscious. So a primary negative feeling such as sadness can create a secondary negative feeling of despair, which can cause an even greater tertiary feeling of depression. And depression can then get shoved into your storehouse of negative emotions, which then hangs around you like a fog all day, because whenever they arise, it creates more meta emotions. And so you try to push negative feelings out of your awareness because you don't want to feel it. There's an automaticity of not wanting to feel negative emotions. And then they get more and more condensed in the storehouse of, of your unconscious and in the storehouse of your emotional, let's say, module to the point where we can become completely debilitated by negative emotions or have a, a, a constant despair or depression around us all the time. Uh, okay, last question for now. Go ahead. I like depression. This is one way that depression develops. Yeah. Uh, where you have uh, negative emotions arise, it causes automatic meta emotions to then increase and increase and increase outside of our awareness automatically due to just the animalistic wiring of our brains. Bad is bad. Well, more bad is, well, more bad. And that more bad is, well, guess what? More bad. Creating more and more negative emotions until 
our emotional storehouse is stuffed full of negative feelings that we don't want to let arise in our, our awareness. Good news is, now that we're understanding the joint in the brain that causes this, we can reverse this causality. We can turn back the clock because we understand the mechanisms involved. One of them is perceiving this negative emotion as permanent. So procedural knowledge needs at least 50 milliseconds for the procedural knowledge to then match. So if you think something in your awareness and your working memory is permanent for at least 50 milliseconds, which is a very short amount of time, procedural knowledge will arise, match, fire a secondary negative emotion. So the misperception of permanence is what causes this runaway train. Good news is that there are practices that turn back the clock, reverse the causality of our minds, such as detached mindfulness. But the science is in. People across the world have done uh, empirical studies that show the releasing of negative emotions. And uh, what this has to do with is awareness of internal events without controlling or suppressing them. And by maintaining a certain kind of awareness, an awareness that sees the impermanence of an experience called equanimity, and there's a little signal there, we'll just sort of use that as a, a shortcut. By maintaining equanimity, this awareness of the impermanence, it stops the automaticity, and then you can calmly and in a controlled way can interact with your environment. Hi, sir. Could you just keep it down? Thank you. <laughs> okay. You can maintain equanimity. The awareness of impermanence, and this can stop negative emotions and release them from the storehouse of your subconscious. These feelings you think are permanent are not. Nothing is permanent. And this requires the increase of metacognitive sensitivity. Sensitivity. Like I said, if you've never read Braille, you don't have the sensitivity to read it at first. But you can develop that sensitivity and you can see the micro nuance of tactile or inner experiences. And we talked about how they're one of the best Metaphors for this is seeing sunlight on water. It seems permanent. It seems permanent from far away. But if you look close, like all experience, once you look at a pattern, it's already gone. If you unfocus your eyes, oh, it seems permanent. But if you zoom in, your experience, as soon as it arises, stays for a second and is immediately gone. Whether it's visual experience, what you're seeing right now, some feeling, if you zoom in on it, if you have greater metacognitive sensitivity, you can experience the moment to moment impermanence. Procedural knowledge doesn't have time to match to it. Once you are aware of it and it's already gone, procedural knowledge can't react to it. It stops the blind automaticity from, from engaging. So metacognitive sensitivity is considered the extent to which one is able to perceive their own mental states. Now, from birth, with our eyes open to the world, we've been focused outside, outside, and we haven't had the training to perceive the, the nuances of our thoughts and feelings and the the processes within our own mind, but we can. Uh, this can include greater conscious awareness of thoughts, emotions, feelings. Low sensitivity can make feelings seem permanent, causing this blind runaway automaticity. Meta-emotions that can then consume and control you. High metacognitive sensitivity can allow you to perceive the impermanence of experience and avoid a significant amount of, I mean, if you've never, there's a time when you've never seen your fingerprints. And then a child usually sees their fingerprints for the first time and says, wow, there's a whole landscape down there. Like this, you can have a sharper awareness of the inner landscape of your thoughts and engage with them more beneficially. This can then unhook mechanisms at the base of your mind that just happen automatically, that have been causing negative emotions and negative behavior patterns. It frees us from the blind automaticity of, of the mind. Any questions so far? Metacognitive sensitivity enables detached mindfulness. And so when you zoom in on a feeling, low metacognitive sensitivity causes blind negative emotions. Having greater metacognitive sensitivity, honing your awareness, having greater perceptual access to the truth of things, which is that your feelings are, they are transient. They are ephemeral. They are permanent, like sunlight dancing on water. If you really zoom in on your feelings, they are changing moment to moment, moment to moment. 
And when you are aware of that, oh, there's not enough time for procedural knowledge to match to it. Because your awareness has moved from a far away negative emotion seeming permanent and catastrophic, causing uh, negative meta emotions. You zoom in on the experience itself, you see it's changing moment to moment nature. And because your awareness of it is under the 50 millisecond threshold, procedural knowledge can't arise. You can stay in the moment to moment experience. Negative emotions can arise on the surface. You're aware of their impermanence, and they pass away. Old emotions come up. Stay for a while. If you maintain high metacognitive sensitivity and equanimity, they'll pass away. Old negative emotions then come up from your emotional storehouse. Stay for a while, pass away. Through this lens of equanimity and metacognitive sensitivity, you can empty out the storehouse of your negative emotions. There's a metaphor of when you have a campfire, anybody that are on a campfire, you keep throwing wood on the fire. What happens? The old wood doesn't burn, just the wood on top burns. And if you keep throwing wood on the fire, more and more of it piles up. But if you stop, the wood on top burns and passes away. And then the old wood underneath it burns and passes away until eventually all that you're left with is a, a glowing coal. This is a metaphor for how you can uh, dissolve the negative emotions that are within your storehouse. You stop throwing wood on the fire. You stop perceiving them as permanent. It takes training. Old emotions come up on the surface, pass away, you become free of them. Again and again, um, it's, uh, it's a process by which you dissolve the, the negative emotions in your emotional storehouse through a a particular lens of awareness, and you can free yourself from the automaticity of your programmed evolved mental states. So we move from blind automaticity, which increases negative emotions to understanding the mechanisms of the mind, and unhooking that mechanism at the base of the mind, and freeing ourselves from blind automaticity that can then consume us. You've seen people, as they grow up and get old, become consumed with rage, sadness. They're always uh, mad about something. That is because this has happened over and over and over throughout their life. Blind automaticity to emotions they don't understand and can't perceive clearly. And millions of people have done metacognitive training and say this works. They say they used to be rage addicts. They used to have terrible depression. They used to have addictive tendencies, and uh, as a result of, of constant daily metacognitive training, they are able to free themselves from the uh, blind automaticity that would otherwise direct their thoughts and behavior. Excellent. So the question is, if you keep engaging in metacognitive sensitivity, with mental training, awareness, uh, equanimity, does it become automatic over time? Yes, it does. And I'm going to talk about how metacognition can become a skill. Through metacognitive training, it's like you guys are psychic. You just see down the road and you're able to then just sort of foresee my next slide. It's incredible. Metacognitive training. So again, we have negative emotions causing runaway automaticity, causing greater and greater negative emotions, but practicing certain meta instructions, so this is equanimity, uh, greater metacognitive sensitivity, greater focused awareness of your emotional and uh, mental states enable you to train your mind so that negative emotions don't uh, increase over time. So meta instructions can direct cognitive processes to attain a more desirable cognitive stage, such as greater focus, lower negative emotions. So in this example, you see uh, what the difference between system one blind automaticity and system two use of Meta instructions. And meta instructions enter working memory. Be aware of the impermanence of your experience. Focus in on it. It turns the false perception of permanence into a correct perception of impermanence. So the misperceived permanence of emotions become a correct perception of their impermanence, which then 
unhooks and disconnects negative emotions and blind automaticity. It engages with the causal mechanisms of the mind so that you can uh, train your mind to not react automatically, not wallow in certain thoughts, and you can decrease negative thoughts and feelings and increase beneficial thought patterns. It requires repeated practice though, just like anything. Playing the piano requires repeated practice. Driving your car, you're not good at it right away. And you'll think, I'll never get this. And a lot of people who begin metacognitive training say, I'll never get this. But again and again, you find that you're less reactive. Those old emotions you thought would always be there for their entire life. I can't believe it. They're gone. I thought they would be permanent. Yep. Yep. No, they can, they can totally dissolve. And then you can move on. But it does take the repeated practice and daily practice. And there is skills literature showing how this happens in the mind. So skill acquisition, whether it's motor skills, whether it's math skills, whether it's metacognitive skills, they engage in similar mechanisms of the mind where uh, repeated practice of an action results in improved performance. With practice, almost any action become faster, more automatic, less error prone. So skill learning can include motor skills such as driving, as I said, or cognitive skills such as math, metacognitive skills such as the awareness of the impermanence or, or, or sharper attentional control. It begins with uh, declarative knowledge, as we see at the top here. This is the skill learning. This is practice. This is time. So with practice, say if you're learning to drive, you get declarative instructions, verbal instructions. Key goes in here. The right pedal is the gas. The left pedal is the brake. And what you do is you start to build up procedural knowledge. You get a sense of how hard to press on the gas. You see in a driving instructor being thrown around by somebody not knowing just how how much gas how much pressure to put on the brake and how much to put on the gas and in your turning but eventually procedural knowledge builds up with that declarative knowledge and eventually just procedural knowledge is left you don't need verbal instructions anymore you don't need declarative knowledge anymore you can just automatically go about driving you get in the car you're sleepy you know you know and if somebody were to ask you hey how do you drive? I've never driven before. You'd be like, ah, how do I explain this? Your declarative knowledge is gone. You got to reinterpret to the person who's never driven before. And what do you see people do? You'll see, okay, hold on a second. Uh, let's see, they're an expert driver and they go, how do I explain this? Okay, so let's see, I get in the car. They got to react it out. They go, you check the mirror, you put your you put your key in on the right. And then you see, so what's next? You, you're watching your body go about automatic processes that have become proceduralized. Same with math or multiplication or division and cognitive skills or metacognitive skills. They become proceduralized over time. You start off with instructions. And as you build up procedural knowledge, they become automatic and efficient, and fast, and less error prone. Okay, so that's called proceduralization. And so emotional intelligence can get trained that as well. So the three stages of skill learning, what, no matter what it is, uh, in terms of this model of Fitz and Bosner being declarative, declarative and procedural, the procedural this model of proceduralization is this three-stage uh, model where you learn declarative knowledge, verbal instructions, whatever it is, instructions for tennis or driving, or directing your own mind, or the multiplication tables. Uh, you learn the declarative knowledge first, and as the task knowledge is acted out, it begins to trigger production rules, which is procedural knowledge, to carry out the performance. Uh, as knowledge is repeatedly practiced, it builds up and builds up and builds up its procedural knowledge. With that practice, performance speeds up, it becomes more accurate, errors go down, you get better and better at tennis, you get better and better at driving, you get better and better at uh, doing math, multiplication, long division, or uh, directing your attention or emotional states. And eventually, you embed this procedural knowledge in the very base of your mind. This small little trickle of procedural knowledge becomes a stream, becomes a river, becomes an ocean of fast, automatic, effective skills. 
you can have automatic uh, positive behaviors uh, consume your mind in a deliberate way, in the same way that blind automaticity would consume your mind if you let it uh, run away with you. And so again, you have declarative knowledge move into your uh, your working memory. This triggers production rules. If this knowledge then acted out, this is the nature of the informational processes. And you have this process of proceduralization. We're in a novice in the beginning, declarative knowledge such as instructions moves into working memory. It then triggers productions then act it out. You keep needing the declarative knowledge. You keep needing the instructions for driving or math. You know, you keep needing to uh, go back to the manual. <laughs> but as proceduralization starts to take up, the uh, procedural knowledge starts to pair with the actual stimulus itself. So the stimulus bring uh, knowledge into working memory, which then acts out the productions. Eventually, you start to skip the knowledge itself. You know what to do. You get in your car and your body automatically starts to reach for the keys and you know which side is the gas pedal and you know uh, to buckle up without even thinking about it. So the procedural knowledge skips the knowledge, the declarative knowledge, until you become an expert where uh, productions just run on their own. So here's a little, again, a little animation where you have declarative knowledge chunks and procedural memory, these productions that interact with each other. You get the facts, but you also have these little if-then statements that act like gears or conveyor belts that move the system. They, if there's a situation, then it acts it out and moves the system or directs your behavior or actions, such as if you're driving. So in this three-stage model, you can have, uh, in a novice, you need the knowledge to move into working memory. It then brings procedural knowledge up and acts it out. During proceduralization, yeah, you have the knowledge, but it starts to skip. It just gets associated with the cue. Your body's in the car. You don't need the knowledge anymore. You have the procedural knowledge, and this gets rewarded because it's faster or automatic. Reward learning acts in your favor. With the expert, you just have the stimulus and the productions acting on their own. And this is a reward, and this is how uh, cognitive skills can go through this three-stage process. Through knowledge, moving to work memory, and being practiced, you have um, procedural knowledge arise, become associated, become rewarded, and then become this ocean of positive automatic processes embedded in the, in the base of your mind. Any questions about that? Is this clear? Do these animations help? Yeah. Nodding? Okay. So um, this is how you make the automaticity of the mind work for you. This is how you build working out habits. This is how you build good eating habits. This is how you build, if you need to jog in the morning, oh, it's really hard. In the beginning, you need to build up uh, the instructions to just go, and then eventually, you find yourself automatically putting your shoes on in the morning until you just roll out of bed, put your shoes on, and you find yourself uh, you know, going for a run or jog without even meaning to. Same with attentional focus, or math skills, or if anybody's taking martial arts, you know, you, you get instructions first. Do your stance like this, grapple like that, punch like this, but eventually these processes build up or by uh, this uh, process of learning an instrument. This is how automaticity builds up and starts to run on its own. Um, of course, you never totally get rid of your conscious access. You can't do it totally in your sleep, but this is how you build up skills of any kind. And we were originally without our understanding of how to use computers, how to use cars, how to put on our shoes, tie shoelaces. But eventually, they become automatized. Do you even remember learning how to tie shoes? No, it's just this automatic procedural knowledge. And that's how we build habits of mind. This is the last slide about how we build habits of mind and how they can run automatically and how system two processes can be embedded into system one processes. And that's what we'll leave it for today. I'll be here for any questions. And I'll see you on Friday. Thank you.